Hey guys, it's Lydia and Steve from Pinelands Nursery and we're here walking around our seed production fields with Kelly Gill from the Xerces Society just checking out what's in bloom and finding all the pollinators buzzing around. Great, so we're doing this video to celebrate National Pollinator Week and we're trying to highlight some of the best early blooming wildflowers for bees as well as the bees and other insects that are visiting the flowers here at the farm. So you'll see throughout the video a range of different species. When we make our seed mixes, we try to include um, a wide variety of species that bloom from early spring to late fall. So we're in June here in the mid-Atlantic and we'll highlight what's blooming now, but you should come back later for a video in the fall to see the fall blooming wildflowers as well. Stay tuned and thanks for coming. Now, pensamin is an early blooming flower. It's gorgeous, I think. And the bees, if Tommy can get a close up on one of the bees going into one of the flowers, they crawl right up in there into the flower. And all you'll see is this little bee butt sticking out the back. And the reason the flower is designed like that is so the bee has to crawl on to slurp up the nectar and get, get all the pollen on it and increases pollination when they crawl on that flower. And when we design our seed mixes, um, for pollinator habitat restoration projects, we try to have species blooming throughout the season, so from spring to fall with overlap in between. And penstemon is a really important early season blooming plant. As you can see, it's very floriferous and it blooms at a time when a lot of other wildflowers aren't in bloom. So it's a really important component of our seed mixes here in the East. So this is penstemon hirsutus, and it's just at the end of its flower. Um, you can see the uh, seed starting to form here, the little seed pods. It's um, a little shorter than the penstemon digitalis, but it has this beautiful purple color as you just saw. It's my favorite. Yeah, nice lower growing. If you're looking for lower growing plants for a small area or a narrow strip, this would be a good choice, as well as the, the penstemon digitalis. It also kind of smells a little bit like a wet dog, but I kind of like the smell. So, Isn't this cool? A flower matches my shirt. So I have a quick question. While we're talking about the honeybees and the native bees, lately I've heard there's kind of a controversy that honeybees are out competing native bees. There are um, some situations where we see where you have um, um, large beekeeping operations where you have hundreds and hundreds of hives mm -hmm. and limited resources those honeybees can um, kind of strip those flowers uh, of the resources basically strengthen numbers yeah. and that's kind of the um, theory of bringing them to crops too you have strength in numbers they might not always be the most perfect pollinator match for that blooming plant but they make up for it in uh, the amount of bees foraging mm. So that's true, and honeybees can pass on disease to native bees as well. So there are some, uh, there is some competition there, and and you know we have some guidance on our website, the Xerce Society website, on how to manage that and try to keep our uh, wild bee populations as healthy as possible. So they can coexist. So by planting wildflowers in, in a setting without too many hive bee. Uh, European beehives, they can coexist. Yeah, I think the point is, especially in natural areas where you have um, kind of wild habitat, that we don't want to be bringing lots and lots of honey beehives into those areas because those are areas where we ha likely have uh, more rare wild bee species. The wild bee species we see on farms typically, not always, are kind of more common species. But on some of these, um, natural areas, these undisturbed natural areas, there can be more rare species that we don't see uh, all the time that, you know, like we would on a farm or in agricultural lands. So yeah, bringing a lot of honey beehives to those areas would certainly benefit honeybees with a lot of resources available as far as flowers go. But on the other hand, it can be detrimental to the wild bees that are, are living in that area. So it is a trade-off and we have to be really careful what we're doing. And this is Heliopsis helianthalides. It's a beautiful flower, and uh, the bees and pollinators and birds really love this one. And Kelly will elaborate. 
how are they adapted to pollinate this type of flower? They just kind of rummage around on it, it looks like, versus yeah. crawling into it. So these are open like a ray and disc flower. Mm -hmm. So these petals, you know, these are petals, but the, um, the inside here is made up of all these little tiny flowers. Mm -hmm. So typical of the, the aster family. Uh, and yeah. they go in and, and um, that pollen is readily available to them. It's very easy to get at mm -hmm. compared to some of the tubular flowers. Um, and some of our, our crop plants like tomatoes, which hold their pollen captive in kind of like a, like a shaker type um, structure that actually need to be buzzed at a certain frequency wow, to no release way. that pollen. I had no idea. Yeah, so bumblebees and some of our native bees are really good buzz pollinators. Bumblebees especially because of their size. So when they land on a tomato, not that we're filming tomatoes here, but this is a good little snippet. Um, they actually grab on to the flower with their jaws, with their mandibles, and they vibrate their wings at a, a certain frequency. It's like a perfect C. And that the dislodges pollen. the pollen and it kind of rains down on them. Some other native bees can do that as well. Um, honeybees, they're not bad because they can't do it. It's just not in their physiology. They just don't have that behavior. So when it comes to those kind of plants and several other types of crop plants like blueberries um, and things like that, our native bees are really the superstar pollinators. That's amazing. I just saw well, parasitic makes... wasps. Oh, really? Here too. So something to note about wildflower plantings as well along with pollinators these plants also attract things and we saw some lady beetles in here uh, which are predators so predatory insects and uh, parasitic insects which feed on um, pests so pest insects of plants so not only are you getting pollination benefit when you may have a wildflower planting on the farm but you're also attracting these beneficial insects that can help suppress some your insect pests of crops. Mm. So there's a lot of benefits here to having these plantings. Um, beyond that, Steve, you mentioned earlier your love for birds. A lot of these plants in the fall will offer seed that are attractive to birds. Oh, yeah. And some will uh, persist through the winter when there's not a lot of food around. So, you know, multiple layers of, of benefits for wildlife in general. It's amazing. Out in this field specifically, I see a lot of indigo buntings in land. And it's so cool to see their bright blue plumage on these yellow flowers. Um, and like Kelly was saying, on the purple cone flower, especially a lot of the goldfinches, there'll oh, be yeah. hundreds of hundreds of uh, the goldfinches in the purple cone flower, and they'll just be munching on the seed. And you get in there, and they'll fly off, and it's just it's gorgeous. <laughs> so we're out here in the Coreopsis uh, lanceolata right now, and there's so many pollinators buzzing around. We just saw some surfeit flies. And honeybees and there's some really uh, um, a lot smaller bee species that you might expect with, to be a gnat or even a fly. They're very tiny and you need to get up close to the flowers to see them and they tend to like this open kind of shallow flower. So you would see more of those smaller pollinators on flowers like this and uh, the Heliopsis that we just saw rather than those um, tubular flowers of the penstemon we were looking at earlier. But if you do get close here, you can see a lot of activity. So if you were here three or four days ago, this field was in its prime. And although it's still bright yellow and gorgeous, the flower of these flowers are going into seed. I have some of the seed on my hand right here. It smells very fresh and spring-like. But yeah, you should have seen it three days ago. It's in its full glory, but now this plant blooms and turns into seed fairly quickly. But another great feature about this plant is that it can have a second bloom later in the fall or later in August, August, September, she will have another bloom. And again, another important component of a pollinator seed mix because of that early bloom potential. And it also is one of the species that tends to fill in more quickly. So a lot of our wildflowers take a long time to grow, especially when you plant them from seed. But things like Coreopsis will come up a little bit more quickly in a, a new seeding and give you a little bit of instant satisfaction that something's growing. Um, while the other slower growers are taking two to three years to establish in flower. So we like to use this a lot for that early part of establishment and also the early season bloom. 
don't know if you can see him. He's right through there. It's a type of serpent fly. Yes. Oh. Blue <laughs> away. But, Camera shy. So serpent flies, real quick. I'll do a brief introduction. In their larval stage, they eat a lot of uh, kind of detrimental pests. And aphids. I'll like take aphids. Yes. So in the larval stage um, of a certain group of serpent flies, they're great predators. So they'll prey on crop pests. They'll prey on things like aphids and soft-bodied insects. And in the adult stage, in the winged stage, when they're flying around, they visit so many flowers that they are pretty decent pollinators and they've been used in, in uh, crop production for things like carrots and other plants that have kind of shallow um, umbel shaped flowers. So you'll see them a lot on those type of flowers. It's easier for the adults to access the nectar there. Um, but you'll also see them in these types of flowers as well. And a lot of times they might look like a bee, but um, they're a fly, so they kind of mimic those yellow um, and black bands that you would see maybe on a honeybee or a bumblebee. Yeah. Well, we certainly give terrible names to our um, native plants. Yeah. You know, we have like um, uh, tree of heaven for the invasive yeah. species, yeah. and then things like which is the worst swamp milkweed and spiderwort for our native species. So. You know, for a long time, Xerxes was just saying, maybe we could just call this monarch flower. And, <laughs> and sneeze, make, sneeze weed, and too. sneeze yeah. weed, right, yeah. Which so, is perfect for uh, honeybees. So don't let, don't judge a plant by its name is the moral of that story. Lydia, do you want to give us a little brief description yeah. about this plant? This is a Sclepia syriaca common milkweed, and if you can see, there's a bunch of uh, milkweed beetles um, flying around here. We've seen some weedy beetles as well and we just saw a monarch butterfly this flower like they said smells beautiful and it just started to flower so we're gonna collect the seed in a couple weeks and a really cool feature about this seed it's actually edible you can eat the seed pods and soon my brother and I will be doing a video about how we collect the seed and how we cook it up and we'll eat it and we'll show you how to make it and other than being uh, a very important host plant for monarch butterfly. Uh, a bunch of research studies show that this is one of the most attractive plants for other types of pollinators as well as those beneficial insects I was mentioning that prey on crop pests. So really important high value plant. Um, you know we call them the ice cream plants for pollinators. They're really really critical and we tend to see this declining in our landscape a bit. So a lot of monarch efforts are trying to put more milkweed into mixes and get big milkweed stands established so we have more host plants for monarchs as well as nectar plants for other um, flower visitors. Anybody has ever pulled off a seed pod from common milkweed plants, you'll notice that there's a floss attached to the seed that helps carry it through the air. It's like a very uh, silky material. That floss has been used in several different applications over time. One of them being uh, filling for hypoallergenic pillows for people who are allergic to down. That can be a very soft, fluffy alternative. And historically, um, back in World War II, the floss from seed pods were collected to fill life jackets, life preservers. So there's a, a long history to this plant and its uses, as well as its ecological value. I like how you said it's the ice cream. Ice um, cream yeah. plant for bees. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Calamagrossus canonensis, and this is a beautiful <laughs> seed. Um, check it out. It grows in wet areas, and um, a lot of insects and birds We'll use this and it's great to have around your pollinating uh, flowers because like I said insects and other species they use this habitat and cover especially in winter time. Mm -hmm. Yeah most people think of our native grasses our warm season grasses and cool season grasses um, as cover for wildlife in particular birds and small mammals but we do include grasses in uh, wildflower mix at a small percentage it tends to give the planting structure. So for the very tall stemmy wildflowers that tend to kind of flop over, having grass in that planting holds them up, gives them a little something to lean on. Um, for our bunch grasses, 
Our bumblebees like to nest at the tuft at the bottom of that bunch grass. So sometimes those grasses will lodge a little bit and create a nice cavity protected, undisturbed area for bumblebees to build nests. And we also have butterflies, grass skippers that use um, some of our grasses as their caterpillar host plant. So also a very important component of our seed mixes. And again, it has all those other wildlife values that um, Steve was mentioning. Now real quick, while we're still rolling, I want you to pan around. I want to show you this purple cone flower. Um, if you guys find our videos interesting and you, you like them a lot, you should leave a comment and Tell us how you feel about them. We'd love to do more. This flower is about to bloom and we can teach you a lot about it. Um, I'd like to tell you all about the medicinal facts about this plant. And you can see how great it is for the pollinators once it blooms. So leave a comment, tell us how you feel about our videos and um, hopefully we can get back to you with some more videos. Some are blooming here. Bears of the insect world, right? <laughs> bumblebees. Everybody loves bumblebees.